Uh, is it Mueller? Or... Yeah, I'm recording. Oh, hey, are, you, are you also like letting people in the room? Yep, I will be in charge of that. Welcome everyone to Balkan Circle. My name is Mary Neuberger. I am the director of the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, and I'm a professor of history at UT Austin. Um, Kirill is my co-host. Do you want to introduce yourself? Thank you very much, Mary. For those of you that uh, haven't, we haven't met yet, my name is Kirill Avramov. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Slavic and Eurasian Studies, and I'm also uh, director of uh, the Global Disinformation Lab, which is housed in the Center of Russian Eastern European Studies. But most importantly, I'm your co-host uh, for the Balkan Circle, which uh, begins its third season. And we're very, very excited to have um, uh, the circle growing and be very active. And we're looking for a wonderful uh, speaker series and seeing you each and every Friday. Uh, Mary, uh, today our first speaker has a really interesting topic, and I'll pass the floor to you to um, introduce her uh, to the circle. Uh, yeah, it's my pleasure today to introduce Brigitte Lenormand, who's an associate professor of history in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Maastricht University. In addition to writing numerous articles, she's the author of two books, Designing Tito's Capital, Urban Planning, Modernism and Socialism in Belgrade. Um, which was published with the University of Pittsburgh Press in 2014, and her more recent book, Citizens Without Borders, Yugoslavia and its Migrant Workers in Western Europe, which was published with the University of Toronto Press in 2021. I'm so glad you wrote this book. <laughs> it's a great topic, and I, I, you're the one to write it. So I'm really excited about this book. I'm really excited about this topic. And today um, you'll be talking about, I'm assuming from your book, your title is Citizens Without Borders, Yugoslavia and its Migrant Workers in Western Europe. Okay, um, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really uh, excited to be uh, telling you about my book. Uh, I've done a few talks in Europe, but I believe you might be my first North American talk. So what a great place to kick things off. Um, I'm assuming I can share my screen, is that the case? Let me just, um, I always get a little bit confused about the best way to do Zoom and PowerPoint. Let's, um, let's see if I can make it work. Um, okay, <clears throat> if I do this, um, what do you see? We see it, but we also we, see. Mm -hmm. If you um, can you see my notes or do, yeah, do you we see, see the main screen? We see. I don't know if that's your notes, but we do see two different slides at the same time. What we okay, see is your then, next. Yeah, we see your then next we've slide. Got the, we've got the wrong, we will see wrong your wrong notes. version. Okay, let me, <laughs> let yes. me stop sharing and try that again. And you don't <laughs> want to share those notes because who knows what's in there? Because who knows? Yeah, all the <laughs> embarrassing stuff. Um, okay. And what about, no, gosh, it's always very confusing to me. Okay, I apologize, everyone, for. Oh, that's all right. You know, that gives us time still. There are people joining us. I'm so glad to see uh, such a large Um one. Yes, maybe. Exactly. Is this maybe the version? Or if anybody um, has any suggestions on another. Uh, yes, um, please put can you just do slideshow, slideshow view? Yeah. You now we that? see. Oh. So, still the same thing? Okay, hold on. I'm going to see if. Yeah. Um. um. I wish there was a way to, I want to show you the actual, <laughs> the way the slideshow is supposed to look. If anybody in the audience can give me advice on how to get. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's crowdsource this technical support. Anyone? <laughs> um, is it always, if you click the slideshow, would uh, bring this to the previous screen? Or if you just push it, play it from the start, possibly? Um, Taylor? I think, I think there's a setting on the slideshow tab that you should be able to change from like presenter view to um, to something to like normal view. I don't know what the term is. Thank you, Taylor. Okay. Well, in Let's the worst case, I can just show you the very unsatisfying view that you all see because um, I don't I don't really know how to make this 
how to make this work. Um, I'll try one last thing. I don't know. Oh, I could just talk indeed. Maybe that's what I'll do. So let me just show you my, the view of my slideshow that's uh, with, with uh, you know, that, that you're not supposed to see and that, that'll be fine. Um, I'll share. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so you're hopefully seeing, um, oops, that's my email. Hopefully you're seeing um, just my PowerPoint, what I'm seeing. Um, so again, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about um, my book. Oh, and let me just, I have, I do have a, I do have a nice, um, there we go. That way, and hopefully you're not seeing my notes because um, I've got them on Adobe Acrobat and that way I can navigate through my presentation without you having to see my notes. Yeah, so don't, don't stress, everything is fine. Uh, Everything's gonna be okay. Absolutely. All right, I'm More just scrolling yours. upwards here. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> So um, today I'm just going to take you quickly uh, through um, through my book. I'm going to provide a little bit of context uh, on the history of uh, uh, of labor migration from socialist Yugoslavia to Western Europe during the Cold War. I'll introduce you to the research question that uh, that got me started and the sources I used. Mostly, I'll be focusing on the book structure. Um, and I'll be focusing on one key argument as part of, uh, of, of that, um, uh, of, of, of what I'm gonna talk to you today, which is this idea um, of migrant identities as being co-constructed. Um, and in my book, I focus on co-construction specifically by, um, by the Yugoslav uh, authorities at various levels of government uh, on the one hand and the migrants themselves on the other hand. Um, and here you see a lovely illustration by one of my favorite artists um, who depicted um, the life of a migrant worker um, from personal experience, Drago Trumbetas. Uh, he was um, a typesetter in um, a, a West German newspaper for many years. Um, and he, uh, he produced a lot of amazing artwork um, with quite a kind of acerbic kind of um, a satirical, often um, humorous look at what it was like to be a, a migrant worker. He also wrote books, um, but here you can see a little bit the sort of interior scene um, of, a, of a, you know, what we might think of as a typical migrant worker, um, a sort of uh, a man in his prime living in a, in a ramshackle, attic room with um, the sort of detritus of migrant life all around him, bottles of alcohol, posters on the wall. Um, I believe it's a, it's a yacht advertisement. I'm not in, entirely sure anymore, clothing hanging on the wall, but just kind of a snapshot of the lonely and challenging life um, of a migrant worker. Um, all right, so a little bit of context. Um, labor migration from Yugoslavia to Western Europe uh, within the context of socialist Eastern Europe was a, a rather unique situation. Um, it was the only socialist state in Eastern Europe to really uh, pursue the, the strategy of opening its borders and in fact, not just allowing its workers um, to work abroad, but encouraging them by setting up um, agreements with states across Western Europe to facilitate labor migration. Um, I, I say it's East meets South because you have this dimension whereby this is a, a very specific experience relating to a socialist state. On the other hand, Yugoslavia was, um, was very much like many other Southern European states at the time, Greece, Spain, Italy, Portugal, um, in, in, uh, in having this large flow of, uh, of their population working in Western Europe. Um, what happens in Yugoslavia is um, you have um, a, a series of different incremental policies um, that open up the border um, for various reasons, driven by a desire to improve its global image. Um, it was also a response to illegal border crossings, um, trying to sort of find a better way to regulate um, the movement of people across the border. There were also anticipated reforms that would increase unemployment um, and a desire to capture worker remittances. So for all these reasons, Yugoslavia 
um, changes its uh, its passport regime and allows its workers to uh, to go and seek employment abroad. And in fact, starting um, in the second half of the 1960s, it strikes a series of bilateral labor agreements with uh, various states, uh, most famously West Germany. Um, labor migration was framed as temporary, um, and it was explained to um, the population, you know, why indeed are we sending our workers uh, abroad um, to toil in capitalism? Well, it's a necessary step towards Yugoslavia's uh, economic development. I shouldn't say economic step, but economic development. Um, and therefore, you know, um, it's it's just it's a temporary thing. It's going to allow us to modernize, and then eventually, all Yugoslavs will be able to work at home. And um, large numbers of Yugoslavs took this opportunity. The 1971 census estimated that there were close to 600,000 Yugoslavs working in Western Europe. Um, this did not include dependents, and, and that's a really interesting issue, partly because some of the dependents were also employed uh, abroad. Um, so wives were often employed in various ways. But leaving that aside, uh, the survey in general was had all kinds of problems and large, you know, likely uh, uh, underestimated the number of Yugoslav migrant workers uh, by by significant amount. Uh, Ivo Baucic estimated another 50,000 roughly. Um, so who were these migrant workers? Um, well, originally um, there was an overrepresentation both of residents of Croatia and of ethnic Croats from say Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, so when we think of the typical migrant, we tend to think of a, a, an ethnic Croat, although that profile changes over time. And by the 1980s, for example, Serbs are much more represented, um, although the balance was still slightly more tipping towards uh, Croats and particularly in proportion to their population within Yugoslavia. Uh, they were present across Western Europe. Um, the highest concentration was in the Federal Republic of Germany and they were primarily young men. <clears throat> Although um, it's estimated that roughly 30% were women by, um, I can't remember the date, but women did come to represent a significant proportion but they're completely forgotten um, and in fact, very difficult to find in the archival record. Um, they were uh, generally unskilled or semi-skilled, and they tended to be from underdeveloped regions um, of Yugoslavia. I'll show you a map after a little bit later in the presentation that shows a little bit where they were coming from. The other important piece of context is the Croatian Spring, um, also known as Maspok after Masovni Pokret. Um, and here we are uh, referring to the Croatian National Revival um, that took place starting in the late 1960s, originally a, a kind of cultural affirmation uh, movement, increasingly politicized um, and reaches its kind of peak uh, in 1970, 1971, when the Croatian reformist um, communists really start uh, pushing for greater autonomy for Croatia. But in parallel to this, you get um, you know, other movements that are striking much more um, extreme positions, um, much more uh, adopting much more sort of chauvinist, uh, ethnicized language, um, demanding Croa you know, Croatia no longer be exploited by the Serbs, no longer be exploited by, um, by, um, by Belgrade. Um, and within the Croatian Spring, it's important to note that labor migration does become part of that political debate. Um, and the way it's framed is that, you know, Croatia sends the flower of its youth to work abroad in Western Europe, and um, the, the remittances are taxed, and those taxes end up in, the, in, in Belgrade to get redistributed as the Federation sees fit, instead of being spent on developing the underdeveloped regions. And so, um, so there's a connection between the, the Croatian Spring and, um, and labor migration, which I'll develop a little bit more. Okay, so the research question that really kind of got me started on this project um, was the question of, you know, the, all these Yugoslavs living in Western Europe, what ties did they continue to have with Yugoslavia? 
And another couple of questions I had were, um, how did Yugoslav authorities justify to themselves and to their citizens a policy of sending workers abroad to live and work in capitalist societies? And how did it address the negative fallout that surely accompanied this, right? And I was also um, interested in the migrant perspective. How did migrant workers interpret their experiences and how did they feel towards the Yugoslav state after living and working abroad? D did uh, the experience of living abroad change their attitudes um, towards Yugoslavia? Here's another wonderful image by uh, Drago Trumbetas just showing um, <clears throat> people boarding the train uh, in, I think it's could be Belgrade, could be Zagreb, I'm not sure. Um, and, um, you know, people climbing into the train. Some people are climbing through the windows. I don't know if it's this one or another one, but there's a sign saying, um, you know, that you can't smoke and the guy is smoking a cigarette right next to it. So again, capturing, <laughs> capturing a little bit the sort of, um, these sort of like lieu de mémoire, if you like, of, um, of the migrant experience, the train station where people would take leave of their families and embark on these long journeys abroad. The sources I used um, were various. I used um, archival documents, both from the Croatian State Archives and the Yugoslav State Archives. Um, I won't dwell too much on these unless you're interested. Um, I also looked at published materials, um, in particular um, contemporary studies on migration, films, a lot of um, short and long uh, fictional and documentary films on, um, on migrant uh, workers. And I read a newspapers targeted at migrants. And in terms of what I hope to contribute to in this book, <clears throat> so some of it has to do with engaging with historiography of Yugoslavia, uh, in particular, the idea of Yugoslav exceptionalism, which has come to be more and more called into question. Uh, but in, in this particular case, I think there is uh, definitely something to be said about the validity of um, this this framing of Yugoslav history. Um, and it continues building on my interest in Yugoslavia's global connectedness, its engagement with the rest of the world, which I started looking at with my book on urban planning. Um, and in this book, I also develop my thinking about the Yugoslav state as, as being you know, multiple competing actors. Um, and in this particular case, um, there's really a very sort of clear competition uh, and conflict happening in particular between the federal and Republican levels in terms of how they court uh, migrants. Um, but also we see, we see these tensions developing at the local level. And it's very interesting um, to see on the one hand how sometimes these authorities are cooperating with one another and, in, and at, at other moments in time, they're actually working at cross purposes. Um, Beyond Yugoslav historiography, I hope my book will make a contribution to migration studies more broadly, and particularly to the, the, um, the, the line of inquiry that focuses on diaspora engagement. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a broad literature out there that deals with uh, how you know, diasporas don't just exist, they're created. They're created by states seeking to mobilize uh, segments of their population living abroad. And so uh, there's a very interesting literature around that, and um, and I, I'm I'm in this book I sort of develop this idea of the co-construction of diaspora, ex extending it beyond a sort of narrow notion of diaspora as sort of people who live um, abroad over, you know, very long periods of time, including labor migrants in this category, and um, I also. Um, want to contribute to conversations about governing across state borders, um, particularly extending the chronology. We tend to think, you know, or people, scholars, contemporary scholars, not historians as much as social scientists, working on, um, on this notion of, you know, extraterritorial governance, tend to locate that, they tend, they tend to see that as being um, a, a a consequence of, of uh, sort of post Fordist neoliberal world order with the dissolution or the, the sort of undermining of national states and, uh, and uh, you know, the globalization essentially uh, facilitating connections across state borders. And I wanna show that this happens much earlier starting in the 1960s. Um, 
All right, so that's that's those are the kinds of uh, debates that I'm hoping I can maybe make a bit of a splash in. Let's go into the book now. Um, the book's divided into two parts. The first part is about seeing migrants. Um, and the second part of the book is about um, the, the ways in which the state tries to engage with migrants. So in the first part of the book, I basically uh, look at, um, in, in chapter two, I examine the way in which the Yugoslav state constructs this category of um, our citizens living and working abroad. Um, I examined policy documents and scientific studies, um, and I found that this category uh, included some people and excluded others. Um, so labor migration was defined as a very specific category distinct from two other categories. Um, they were meant to be temporary, that is um, two to three years abroad. They were meant to, to be alone. Um, they were um, meant to maintain primary ties with the homeland. Um, so in fact, mirroring very closely the ways in which the Gastarbeiter and similar uh, labor migration programs were being sort of thought out in Western Europe. They were seen as being distinct from the Isalianitsi, so the, the long-term migrants. Um, and they were seen as being um, uneducated, so surplus labor, it was okay for them to leave. And they were seen um, as being purely economic migrants, so distinct from political immigration. And uh, these categories shaped scientific studies, um, and they shaped the collection of data. Um, and ultimately, because of that, um, re, you know, these scientific studies ended up reinforcing these categories. Um, and in some ways blinded the authorities to how migration was actually working in practice. Um, so one example of this is, um, you know, so uh, migrants were supposed to be purely economic and not political. That was politička immigracia, those were the bad guys. Um, so uh, in 1966, when Yugoslavia sends uh, survey takers to collect information about its migrants, when the respondents um, expressed opinions that had any kind of negative political content, those responses were excluded from, from the results of the survey because clearly these were not true economic migrants. So you can see how, um, how this was shaping the collection of information. At the same time, by 1966, uh, 1968, sorry, not 66, but 68, Alerted by consular bodies and other intelligent sources, um, these same state actors increasingly became aware of the discrepancy between the categories they've constructed and the reality um, of, of migration. Um, and uh, so, for example, people were um, starting to stay longer than anticipated. They were losing their ties to the homeland. They were getting involved with local women. They were becoming politicized. Um, they, um, there were increasingly categories of migrants who um, Yugoslavia would have liked to hold on to, professionals, for instance. There's a variety of ways in which they were no longer fitting, uh, fitting the label. And this triggered um, alarm uh, uh, with um, the authorities and led uh, Yugoslavia to try and intensify um, its programs uh, that had the, the, the purpose of binding migrants more closely to Yugoslavia. Of course, the, the Prague Spring also had something to do with it. Yugoslavia was, was concerned that it would have to mobilize its male population against um, Soviet invasion. And the, the idea that three armies were missing from Yugoslavia was also um, alarming. And the push towards greater autonomy for Croatia also empowered uh, some reformists to reinterpret the significance of migration as a form of exploitation of the Croatian people. Um, and this called into question the very notion that it was temporary and development oriented. So the late 1960s really are a moment of crisis. Um, and all of the above is important, not just because it shaped the way in which uh, Yugoslav state actors interacted with migrants, um, in terms of its policies and the programs that it developed to uh, improve ties with its workers, but it also shaped how migrants represented themselves in their interactions with state actors. Um, so you see migrants embracing this discourse when trying to make claims on the state. 
You see them negotiating the terms of their belonging, and you see them also at times outright rejecting the terms um, of, of their belonging. Um, okay. The following chapter, which is called uh, Picturing Migrants, the Gastarbeiter in Yugoslav film, um, is about a different kind of um, conceptualization of migrants. While, while social scientists and state actors use statistical data to craft narratives about migrants, there were other narratives that were potentially even more powerful and pervasive and which act as a window on broader social understandings of migration. And this is film. Um, in film, migrants were represented primarily in negative ways. They were seen as liminal actors that were mediating between two worlds. They were sometimes portrayed as dangerous outsiders. Um, and in fact, I'll move to the next slide because I have some nice images there. Um, they were sometimes uh, portrayed as dangerous outsiders who brought corruption um, to, to, um, to Yugoslavia with them. Um, or they were clowns, victims of their own foolishness, um, so sort of seduced by the trappings of uh, Western consumer culture, only to find out that it was really a, just a, a, a thin veneer over an, an exploitative reality. Um, or alternatively, they were, um, they were victims. And uh, insofar as they were victims, they were they were victims of the failed promises of Yugoslav modernization. So it was used by some filmmakers to critique Yugoslav state policy. Um, just a few illustrations here. You have the film Ludidani. Here you have um, the sort of archetypal uh, labor migrant wearing the labor migrant uniform, which is a really loud suit and a, and a fancy hat. Also some bling usually, um, and usually um, with a, a fancy German car. And in this particular film, uh, this is a man who is completely full of himself um, and of his material success that he's brought back with him. And it, he ends up creating chaos in, in the small town that he's from um, when he, he, he basically strikes up a fight with another, um, another labor migrant. Or you have the, the short film Noj, uh, where this takes place in a train and it's a migrant who's coming home and he ends up threatening the other, he's, he's simply crazy, and he ends up threatening the other members of the train wagon. And ultimately, this ends in tragedy. He gets shot and killed. And in fact, that's the fate of many migrant workers in these films. They often die. So <laughs> it's not good to be a migrant worker. Um, but then you have the sort of the victim. And a good example of this is the young man in the short documentary film Teret. Um, this is a boy whose parents have left to live and work abroad and who is basically stuck running the family farm all by himself. And so it's, it's quite, it's quite a, a film that he's dressed in his best Sunday suit. He's like standing in this muddy field and he's, he's sort of just narrating, it's a monologue, he's narrating his story. And, and then he's towards the end, he sort of turns away and you can see that he's struggling to keep back the tears. So there's a lot of pathos in, in, in this little, film and it later inspired uh, the film Twilight Time uh, that Goran Paskalyevich later realized it's an American Yugoslav co-production, a big uh, uh, fictional film. So just some illustrations of the ways in which um, migrant workers were seen. Here's, here's a film that is particularly um, hard hitting um, by Krsto Papic um, called Specialni Vlakovi or Special Trains. This film is uh, is really interesting because it um, it 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 really is a you know where where other films might be a kind of veiled critique. This is an overt of overt uh, criticism of Yugoslav policy. It shows the journey of migrants uh, of labor migrants from Belgrade to the train station in Munich. And there is some very um, chilling kind of imagery um, that, that draws parallels, in my opinion, with Holocaust imagery. For example, this, uh, this nearly naked worker being having orders barked at him in German as part of the health, um, the health inspection prior to his leaving. And just the notion that you would have these German um, authorities in Yugoslavia 
shouting orders in German to, uh, to Yugoslav workers would have been, I think, um, deeply troubling to, to people at the time. And then you have the contrast between these poor humiliated workers who later on in the film are seen sort of crying in the train wagons when they describe being forced to leave in spite of wanting to remain. And then you have on the right, um, this, um, this, this uh, bureaucrat who basically runs these special trains that go from Belgrade to, to Germany, who, I mean, he's got the smoked sunglasses, he's got the, the gold ring, he's got the pipe, you know, the, the, and he's just simply explaining his, his role in this, um, in, in, this, uh, in, in this process in a very matter of fact way, but the implication is very clear that some people are, are really profiting off of this shameful exploitation of um, Yugoslav um, working people. So that's the first part of the book that really sort of uh, examines the ways in which labor migration is posited as a problem. Um, and in the second part of the book, I examine the various ways in which um, different levels of the Yugoslav state try to fix this problem, try to build a stronger and better relations with its uh, migrant workers. And I focus on cultural and educational policies. I'm going to have to let my cat out the door just one second. All right, JJ, you go. Always has to be a cat moment. Um, so I focus on cultural and educational policies. I look at different tools and different kinds of media that were used. Um, I look at the interactions between different levels of government, particularly in the heated climate of the Croatian National Revival. And I examine different ideas of homeland that were that were deployed in order to um, bind migrants to Yugoslavia which, <clears throat> excuse me, um, could be ideas of homeland that are shaped around, um, you know, ethnic identity. Uh, they were sometimes Yugoslav um, ideas uh, that were articulated around brotherhood and unity or self-management. And sometimes they were very local notions of homeland uh, relating to local landscapes, for example, local dialects. <clears throat> And in this part of the book, I also really make an effort to um, invite migrants to tell their own stories. And um, in particular, I highlight the ways in which they saw themselves as being active agents, um, agents both in shaping the relationship to the homeland and also agents um, uh, in the story of their lives. In contrast, in fact, to the films that I was just talking about where insofar as migrants are portrayed in sympathetic ways, they're always victims. Well, migrants did not see themselves primarily as victims. They might have used that discourse um, if they were making claims on the state, but more often than not, they didn't even do that. They really wanted to portray themselves as people with choices, people making choices. Um, and in order to uh, highlight, pardon me, those voices, um, I focused um, on uh, survey responses and letters to the radio uh, to a radio program that was aimed at migrant workers. And, and finally, I, I look at the particular dilemma that was posed by the second generation. So the children of the people who migrated, um, who were li also living abroad, um, who may or may not have had any experience of Yugoslavia and how Yugoslavia tries to make citizens, loyal citizens out of them. So um, ch chapter four focuses on radio as a, as a means for building uh, ties with migrant workers. Um, I focus on a particular radio program called To Our Citizens of the World uh, that was run by uh, Radio Televizia Zagreb. Uh, in collaboration with, um, with uh, Matica Hrvatska Iselianica, which was um, a government office charged with building ties with um, immigrants and labor migrants. Um, it, in spite of the fact that it was a Croatian level program, it actually specifically rejected ethnic categories in favor of a modern understanding of the Yugoslav citizen that was articulated around popular culture, shared popular culture, and material concerns, the, the everyday life problems of labor migrants. 
Um, it was part music and greetings, so people could write in and request to send greetings to our, their family abroad or their family in Yugoslavia, and part answering questions. Um, and as, as I just hinted at, what was kind of magical about it is that it was simultaneously being listened to by people both in Yugoslavia and abroad. Um, and what's, what's, uh, what becomes clear when you read the letters that were written by migrants to the radio program was the importance of uh, emotion in constructing a relationship between program uh, and listeners. Um, migrants report having all kinds of emotional experiences, trembling, weeping, uh, feeling warm. Um, and, you know, so this is a really embodied kind of experience listening to this radio program. It could also be a very social experience. People would gather together, as you can see in this image, um, and I'm not making any claims that they were listening to this radio program. They may very well have been listening to the cassette tape in there, but the, the idea that you would gather together around the radio, you see this coming up in a lot of, of the letters. Um, so the idea of homeland in this radio program was really conveyed through popular music and through kinship. It was a community of listeners listening together. Um, and the content of homeland was left deliberately vague um, and inclusive. Uh, this radio program is also noteworthy because it presented itself. It was, it, was, it was very much a state program, but it presented itself as the people's radio advocating on behalf of migrants to the state. In fact, there's, there's one particular um, news article that I read in which um, Sino Handel, who was the, the host of this show, talks about how uh, a young man who'd been involved in, uh, in sort of anti-Yugoslav activities reached out to him because he wanted to return home to visit his family and how Sino Handel is able to somehow mediate and convince the authorities to, to sort of um, allow him to return home. So this is the kind of relationship that, that he builds with his listeners. Um, also, when uh, Zagreb is flooded in a devastating way in 1964, listeners write into the station asking him to help, uh, help them sort of reestablish communication with their families. Um, and in fact, the mayor of Zagreb goes on the radio asking for diaspora to send remittances um, and, and, and just material aid. Um, so, so you can see how there's a real kind of relationship that's built through this radio program. Um, the following chapter deals with a different kind of media and focuses um, on, a, on, a, on a very different context. So this looks at newspapers um, that, were, that had a similar function of connecting um, the, the home community to uh, the migrants working abroad. And the, the newspaper in question was called Imotska Kraina. This is the map that I was telling you about that sort of gives you a sense. I, I apologize, it's a bit small. Um, so it's hard, for, it may be hard for you to see um, the, the legend, but you can see where the, the, reason, the regions where the majority of migrants came from. Um, this is from, I believe, the late 1960s or 1971 um, at any rate. Um, Imotska Kraina, the, the Imotski region, is located, uh, is that black area on the, in the Dalmatian hinterland on the sort of um, southwest of Croatia, right? So this little sort of dark, which means that there was 10 to 18 percent of the, of the population was living and working abroad at the time. Um, this newspaper adopts a very different approach to, to building um, a, a feeling of community with its, uh, its readers. It's much more anchored in the local landscape um, and in the local dialect. And, um, you know, it, the, the, uh, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things in this newspaper. There are reports on, um, I don't know, local construction projects. There are there's sort of anecdotes about, or these, what I, I call them anecdotes. They're basically short uh, texts written in dialect, reporting conversations that were overheard or sketching out a scene um, that had taken place. Um, just sort of um, reminding migrants of what they had left behind, basically. There are other articles that are much more focused on material concerns. So there is definitely some overlap with the radio program. But what I found interesting about it is, on the one hand, how the idea of homeland is a much more locally anchored um, concept. 
And secondly, uh, it, what's very interesting to see is how the Croatia, how during the Croatian Spring, it becomes highly politicized, um, and in fact, um, adopts a rhetoric that is much more radical than the rhetoric of the of the um, of the reformist communists in Zagreb in in making a claim of exploitation and victimization of Croatian labor migrants um, at the hands of uh, greedy and anti-Croatian um, um, politicians based in Belgrade. Um, so you can see, in fact, um, and, and it, it's, it's worth pointing out that this newspaper was financed through um, the Socialist Alliance of Working Peoples of Yugoslavia, which is the sort of the, um, the umbrella organization for mass, mass organizations in Yugoslavia. So it was a state-sponsored newspaper, right? It's operating um, as, a, as an organ of the local state, um, and yet it is working very visibly at cross purposes with um, the federal authorities' efforts to try and build ties with migrant workers. Um, just a, a few, a few uh, cartoons that sort of communicate the message <laughs> during this time. On the right, there's this, um, this, uh, this young guy who's wearing the labor migrant uniform who's asking this guy who's dressed very traditionally about, um, you know, they're, they're having a conversation about the, the expenses of keeping the land going, right, the sort of uh, continuing agriculture and at the end, he asks the, the old guy, well, what's left in the end? He's, and, and the old guy says, well, in the end, all that's left is whatever God gives and whatever your children send you from Germany. So um, sort of um, this idea of an impoverished land that, you know, all, that sends its young men abroad and all, all, it, all the, you know, there's no development. All that's left in the end is the remittances that are sent home. Or these two... Um, these two cartoons here on the left um, is someone asking, um, "What are you? What are you in the opchina in the uh, in the in the um, municipality? What are you doing about our men living and working abroad to bring them home, right? For them or for them to stay?" And, th and they reply, "Well, what are you talking about? We've organized 127 meetings." Okay, so the idea of bureaucracy as as sort of uh, cynical and simply wasting time and not making meaningful change. Or on the right, um, one of these wealthy people walks into a bar. Um, he surely works in Germany, says one of the, uh, the people sitting at the table. No, he works in a bank. So again, uh, the idea of the, of the Yugoslav bureaucracy and institutions benefiting off of the, the hard work of these labor migrants and nothing coming back to the community. Chapter six looks at a very specific kind of institution, which is um, Yugoslav workers associations. And what's really interesting about these is the fact that they were, um, on the one hand, um, they were uh, grassroots organizations that depended on volunteer labor in order to thrive. And on the other hand, the Yugoslav state saw them and used them as uh, nodes uh, from in, in a kind of global network from which other kinds of programs could be disseminated, things like pioneer clubs or libraries with Yugoslav newspapers. Um, they had all kinds of classes, uh, sports uh, groups, particularly uh, football slash soccer associations. They had folklore sections. They had um, they would act as local logistical support for traveling shows from Yugoslavia. Um, they would organize socials, so dances and things like that. Um, they, uh, you can see on the one hand how Yugoslavia really tries to control what happens in these clubs. For example, it refuses to support any kind of um, Republican or ethnically based club uh, with very few exceptions. It demands that they be pan-Yugoslav. It sort of maintains surveillance over the, uh, the, the staff of, of these associations. Um, there's, a, there's, there's definitely some tension between these two, um, these two perspectives on what these were um, ultimately, although Yugoslavia touts them as um, an opportunity for workers living abroad to, uh, to participate in self-management because 
if they can't be self-managed in their everyday life in the, in the factory, et cetera, at least they can practice self-management in this, in this little um, Yugoslav enclave that is the, the association. These clubs have been sort of written off as not having a substantial membership. Um, but what I try to show is that in terms of the activities that they organize, they have a much larger reach than simply their, their narrow membership. I realize now that we're reaching the end of our time, so I'll just um, maybe very briefly, and I won't, I won't say too much about the last chapters, but I'll just say something about them. Um, chapter number seven is about, um, it is really about the ways in which the migrants try to um, present themselves um, in their communications with the state. And I, I look at this through a, a fascinating survey that was carried out in 1970, 1971 about attitudes towards migrant return. And they were invited to write out a narrative um, a short one. Many of them end up writing pages and pages telling their life story and explaining why, why they won't return to Yugoslavia or why they would like to, but they can't. And so it's a really interesting, it's really interesting material um, in thinking about, here's the slide, thinking about the ways in which migrants interpreted their life stories and engaged with discourses about them. Um, and, and the ways in which they did or didn't um, see their lives reflected in nationalist claims and discourse. Um, and the following chapters, there are two uh, final chapters that deal with the second generation and specifically with um, yeah, how Yugoslavia tries to build a relationship with, uh, with the second generation. In chapter eight, it's a really nuts and bolts chapter that looks at an, un, I think, a really remarkable program um, for, uh, for, for um, organizing mother tongue education of Yugoslav children living, uh, uh, well, I was gonna say living and working abroad. <laughs> They're children, they don't work yet. So uh, the, the children of, of migrant workers um, and what's one of the interesting things about this um, is that it requires close cooperation between the, the, the federal or Republican levels of government. And so this is an example of how sometimes, I mean, it, it's not easy and it takes a long time, but they are able to somehow uh, put together some pretty um, incredible uh, programming in, in cooperation with one another. It's also very interesting because of the textbook that they end up producing. Um, and uh, in fact, in chapter nine, what I look at is, um, is the textbook and how what kinds of ideas of homeland are in this textbook, which there was only one textbook for all the republics, which is contrary to how education worked in Yugoslavia. It was really a Republican level mandate. But abroad, they had just one textbook. And so it's very interesting to see how they, how they try and negotiate the idea of homeland in this textbook. Um, I'd be happy to say more about that during the question and answer period if anybody has questions, but I think I'll have to leave it at that because we're, we're out of time. But thanks for <laughs> hanging in there with me and my- and Thank my you very much, Bridget. First of all, uh, we would like to do some up. audible clapping here. I know, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bridget. It was a fascinating talk, and, um, um, and yeah, if you could stop screen sharing. Whoops, sorry. I can do that. Reappear. Yeah, let me let me yeah. do that so we can see lots of faces here. Thank All you. right. Well, so we're going to welcome questions from the audience. So if you have a question, you can either raise your hand. We will also be monitoring the chat. Um, this is such an exciting um, book and the research is so rich and I have so many questions and can think of so many things like, what about this? What about that? So um, I guess I can get started if, if no one else will. I, actually, your point at the end brought up something I was thinking about. And that is, was kind of Yugoslavness kind of percolating or was it being even encouraged among these migrants who I'm assuming, I mean, many of them came from say the same village, but they were probably also mixing with Yugoslav migrants from elsewhere in Yugoslavia. 
and sort of finding their commonalities there, I would imagine, in terms of language or food or other kinds of things. I was wondering if it became a particularly rich environment for kind of intermarriage, for creating a kind of a more of a sort of Yugoslav space outside of Yugoslavia. Um, but also, how did those migrants kind of in, uh, interact with Germans or with other cultures that they found themselves in? Um, were they, was there sort of culture shock there? Was there tension there, you know, between those groups and their host um, cultures, environments? Let's just get started with that. But everyone else be thinking of questions, raise your hands, and we will start our conversation. Yeah, so I mean, um, was there Yugoslavness being encouraged abroad? Well, I would say that um, there was certainly the potential for that. Um, so, for example, there were often um, people from all, you know, from various places um, in Yugoslavia working together in a given workplace. Um, and um, my my sense is that while there were also um, so the, the sort of the earlier immigration and the political immigration were very much present and they had their gathering places that were not that were not Yugoslav in, in nature, but very much um, ethnically confined. But there were also clubs or bars largely where people would gather together um, that were from all over Yugoslavia. And of course, the Yugoslav um, workers clubs were were specifically mandated to be pan-Yugoslav. And I have found, um, in fact, some, um, some testimonies of uh, people, for example, working together to put on a folklore show and, and this becoming a really meaningful, emotional experience for them working together. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily representative, but I mean, it certainly shows there was the potential. And again, the, the Yugoslav clubs were really active in organizing dances and um, these touring shows that would come from Yugoslavia that had singers from each one of the republics, they would organize those shows. So I do think there was really, there, there was an opportunity to feel Yugoslav. And certainly the political emigration realized this because they made a point of attacking places where people would gather as Yugoslavs and harassing, you know, trying to force these people to choose ethnic sides. Um, so I think, I think that that is telling. How they interacted with the locals was really, it, it depended on a lot of things, including, you know, how much education they had, whether they um, were living in barracks on site in a, in a factory, or whether they, um, they were able to, you know, live in an intermixed neighborhood. Um, certainly, they also, interestingly, um, you know, some of them may have um, formed friendships and ties with locals, but they, but they also, even if they didn't have that opportunity, if they were um, in, if they were guest workers, they often made friends with other guest workers from other places um, in Southern Europe. So, yeah, it's. Uh, Certainly, there was opportunities to expand their kind of um, their their horizons uh, in that way. Thank you, uh, Teodora Dragostinova. Do you want to go ahead and ask your question, Teodora? I would love to. Thank you so much, uh, Bridget. I um, really am looking forward to into delving into this. Uh, so I have a question about the terminology that the Yugoslav state uh, and maybe society use vis-a-vis -vis, um, these uh, people. I saw in some of your images that uh, the, ter that the term gastarbeiter was actually Yugoslavized, right? I mean, it was sort of like, you know, it, that was used. Um, but I wonder, so how exactly are they being called by the Yugoslav state. You are discussing in your introduction that they use the designation, our citizens, our workers abroad. What exactly does this sound like in Serbo Croatian? Uh, uh, you also are talking here about this distinct category of emigranti versus iselinici, right? I mean, I actually am very curious uh, to, um, to, to figure out what these different categories are. So for example, one question that I have is whether uh, those gastarbeiters were called ever uh, Pechobari, 
which is one of that very long standing, uh, you know, stereotype even used versus, you know, economic migrants. That was definitely a term used in Bulgaria during this same time period vis-a-vis -vis workers, uh, you know, Bulgarians working outside of Bulgaria making money, right? So uh, I am just like curious if you can like unpack a little bit this terminology and also vis-a-vis -vis these children. I mean, are these children, because I imagine, I mean, born in Germany, they didn't get German citizenship. Clearly, did they, I mean, they must have gotten Yugoslav citizenship immediately. So, but are they also a special category since they're born abroad and not born in Yugoslavia? If you can unpack a little bit these categories, I would love to hear how those things work. Yeah, in terms of ter terminology, the official term was Nashi Radnici pri vremeno zaposleni u inozemstvo or Nashi Grajani pri vremeno zaposleni u inozemstvo or inostranstvo, depending on the. And I, I, my sources are all in BCS, so I'm not sure what terminology was being used in, in the uh, in republics where other languages were spoken. It's obviously not, does not roll off the tongue. <laughs> Gastarbeiter was much more of a common uh, term. And um, I did not encounter Pichelba uh, very much at all um, in any of the documentation that I used, but it doesn't mean that it wasn't being used. Um, and in particular, I would imagine that um, migrants from places that had Pichelba continue to use this term because I think, I think in spite of the fact that Yugoslavia is always trying to frame this as a specific phase in Yugoslav history in between, you know, capitalism and, you know, socialism, socialist modernization, I think most migrants saw themselves as a, in a continuity, as, as potentially doing what their grandparents had done, that there was, you know, a longer history there. Um, and for example, in the film Suton, uh, which I, I, I mentioned in my talk, um, the hero is this little boy whose parents have absconded and his dad, in fact, has left his mom and is, is like sleeping with the German woman. It's all very upsetting. But one of the other main actors is this um, old gentleman who had gone to the United States back in the 1930s and then came back. So I think in popular culture, it was also very clearly uh, realized that there's a, a much longer story uh, that it that. That, that was connected to that. In terms of the second generation, they're quite um, diverse. There are the, you know, there are the Yugoslavs who marry Germans and have children who then get citizenship. Um, there are different, also different citizenship laws in different countries. So in other countries, they do get the local citizenship. Um, then there are the, you know, the, the ones, for example, who are born in Yugoslavia and who come over and, um, and, and to, um, in some ways have to learn the local language after, you know, as a second language. And in general, um, in popular culture and also in, in studies, they are portrayed as being confused, as just being neither here nor there. Um, and in fact, there is a, a huge anxiety around this and a huge effort to try and figure out, are they ours or are they lost? Right. And, and it's and it's the, the measure for determining this is largely defined in terms of language acquisition, knowledge of Yugoslav um, concepts and culture, and to a certain extent, also how they self identify. Um, although I argue also in the book that um, things were potentially more complicated because even it's absolutely true that these children didn't feel like they belonged in one category, but they they felt like they belonged in both to a certain extent. And it's also interesting, one study showed that in, you know, in spite of all their, their challenges of fitting in, a, a, a certain percentage, something like a quarter, aspired to return to Yugoslavia. So for them, that was the homeland. So it's interesting. interesting group, and I'd love to do more work on them. Thank you very much, Bridget. And by the way, uh, I'm so, I would like to thank everyone because the discussion is so lively in the chat. Uh, at this point of time, I'll, I'll ask Eva Lucic uh, to ask her question. And then I promise to Oscar to read his because he has some interesting uh, observations or questions regarding the labor migration uh, statistics and distribution. Uh, Eva? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for, for this fascinating talk. I really loved your book. 
I loved reading it. I have one question. Um, I mean, this flow of labor was some kind of interlaced with also flow of capital. And you touched upon this while commenting on the cartoon from Imotska Kraina. And I was wondering if you have come across some statistics yeah, uh, about the flow of capital. So these labor workers sending Deutschmark or Devise yeah, to, to Yugoslavia. Do you know anything about this? I'm wondering because when talking to economic historians, they usually claim that uh, that flow of capital from uh, uh, the labor migrants was one substantial part of the um, states, Yugoslav state's economy. And without that, the society would have basically suffered much more. Yeah? So I wonder if you have anything in regard to statistics or if you know where one can find, yeah? because I have not come across anything like that, neither in the archives nor in the literature. And my second question is, um, I mean, as someone living and working in Sweden, I know that there were some Yugoslavs uh, emigrating also to the northern parts of Europe. So I wonder if you would have integrated also these other those other countries, would that have changed the narrative of your book? Do you see like the German experience as something symptomatic for the uh, Yugoslav uh, Gastarbeiter or labor migrants? Um, I mean, given the uh, given the quantity of, of them. I mean, most of them emigrated to Germany, I agree, but there were also some Yugoslavs spread uh, across Europe. So I was wondering how that might have affected your analysis and the narrative. Thank you. Yeah, so um, my book, uh, so, so let me just preface this by saying that I did really try to uh, capture as much as possible uh, the diversity of experiences. So be because, because there were so many of them living in Germany, a lot of my material does deal with Germany. But for example, in my, in my, in my um, chapter on education, one of the things that, uh, or the chapter, the first chapter on education that looks at this, um, this sort of infrastructure for delivering education. One of my observations has to do with the fact that um, there's, there's really quite a wide diversity in the level of cooperation that they get from these different states. Um, so states like Germany were really eager to cooperate um, and also bear some of the costs, but that meant that they were also involved in the, you know, in the design of the programming and had a certain amount of control over who, who worked there, right? And then you get states like France that are completely uninterested. And so Yugoslavia is responsible for the entire program and there, you know, there's a, a sense of like, um, but both um, of not caring and also of a certain kind of discrimination and hostility towards migrant workers. Then you get Sweden, uh, that is really uh, the opposite of France, uh, where, um, you know, there's a, there's a kind of, a, the, the Swedish state wants to control this education entirely, and it wants to hire its own uh, employees to teach it. And Yugoslavia is kind of stuck trying to figure out how it can have any influence over what these children learn if these if these are going to be teachers that are formed and and uh, and hired in, in Sweden right so I did try to capture that diversity I made a choice to really focus on sources that um, that 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 came from Yugoslavia and that spoke to Yugoslavia's efforts and so my, you know this is maybe a weak side of my book it doesn't it doesn't really provide an in-depth look or comparison of policies in these different states and, and attitudes. Um, although I am, I, I am currently preparing uh, a grant proposal that, that proposes to do just that because I do think that, um, yeah, experiences were diverse um, across these different contexts. Um, so yeah, that's something I, I, I would like to work on in the future. Um, concerning remittances, um, they were quite significant. Um, I, I encountered in the archives estimates at various uh, moments in time. I don't know them off the top of my head because I'm a, a pretty useless person with numbers. <laughs> but um, if you're interested, I can have a look at my sources and you can get in touch with me and I can see what I can share about that. We have a question in the chat before I move to Emily from Oscar Starchild. It says that he seems that the, it seems that the distribution of national frequencies of workers um, 
it says seems mirrored in Bosnia and Herzegovina along ethnic lines. Is this merely coincidental due to chance or is there something more to it? And I'm, I'm not sure exactly what he's asking, but maybe what, I mean, were there, was there recruitment specifically among various ethnic groups quota wise, or, I mean, there, I'm not really sure. That's how I'm interpreting yeah. the question. No, there was, there was not, um, to my knowledge, there was no recruiting along ethnic lines. Um, and in fact, the other thing that's worth noting is only 50% roughly of migrant workers left through these official channels and the other 50% left in their own ways, uh, crossing illegally or as tourists and looking, you know, working, finding jobs once they're there. Um, also, the, you know, in spite of these bilateral agreements, the employers in foreign countries didn't apply the rules and would find other ways of recruiting workers. Um, yeah, I don't, I mean, initially I would say, again, Croats were overrepresented from Bosnia Herzegovina, but, um, but that shifts over time. And so I would be hesitant to, and I don't have any sort of good solid uh, statistical data on me right now. So I don't thank you very much, uh, Bridget. You know, well, thank you, you know, for tackling it. Uh, it seems that, as you're saying, um, uh, that partially kind of covers Oscar's question, uh, especially if we think about the ways and routes, right, of organized versus, you know, self-seeking, uh, um, you know, individual routes to um, uh, labor migration. Uh, it, uh, I would like to ask Emily Grebel to uh, have her question. Thank you so much. This was a really engaging and, and rigorous conversation. And I apologize for having to jump up in the middle of it. I have a sick kid at home. Um, my question, it sort of connects to some of what we're talking about here. And also sort of this comment Theodora wrote in the chat about sort of chiflic migrations. Um, and, and that is, you know, we, we know from some of the other literature on migration and communities of guest workers, right, in Germany, like Jonathan Lawrence's book or stuff on like Croat terrorists, that there were sort of active efforts um, by the German government to like outsource education. And I mean, I'm, I think particularly around Muslim communities, because that's what I've been thinking about a lot recently. Um, and, and sort of the ways that these kind of embassy Islam operated or like cultural societies were given responsibility for certain kinds of like humanitarian work, and healthcare work. And so my question is, um, did the Yugoslav government feel like they were in competition with these other organizations, um, specifically, you know, thinking around the Croat Spring and thinking around like... Um, uh, Mate Tadic's work on like Croat terrorists and the ways they're engaging with these other kinds of organizations, but also then the ways that, you know, Kosovo Albanian Muslims and Bosniaks were kind of being absorbed by different Muslim Turkish groups or kind of exposed. Like, did the Yugoslav government sort of see these as a challenge? And on the flip side, did the migrants see themselves as having kind of options, right? Like, is being part of this migrant community actually opening up a space to kind of participate in different kinds of networks that, that were not possible as a Yugoslav, but mm -hmm. might be possible as a Muslim or, you know, a Catholic anti-communist? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, and, uh, okay, so the, the first thing I would say is, yes, absolutely, Yugoslavia sees itself as being in competition. It sees itself as being in competition with um, overtly um, anti-Yugoslav organizations um, like Chetnik groups and Ustasha groups, like yeah, fringe terrorist movements um, that are recruit that 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 start out by being hostile to these labor migrants, and then that seem to realize that their potential source of fresh blood, and then start recruiting them. And in fact, Mate Tokic. Uh, in his discussion of some of these terrorist attacks, notes that labor migrants were involved in them. So clearly they're having some success. Um, and they're also in competition with organizations that are not overtly anti-Yugoslav, but that Yugoslavia sees as being anti-Yugoslav, such as uh, Caritas, which is a Catholic um, help organization um, that employs priests and other, other people from the Catholic uh, church um, largely in sort of social service type and educational and, you know, sort of keeping young people busy kind of activities, right? 
And uh, Yugoslavia is worried that it that there is sort of Ustasha Croats involved in that and that they're spreading lies about Yugoslavia. Um, and you know, whether it's, you know, no, these are these are problematic because they're anti-Yugoslav, but generally Yugoslavia is worried that Yugoslav that that Yugoslavs need to that they're that they're becoming lost and that they have no sense of belonging anywhere. And so for both of those reasons, they need to be pulled in to some kind of framework, some kind of structure. Um, and 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 that it's it's almost a, a psychological issue. Um, whether or not these migrants feel a sense of agency is a really good question. It's never in the scholarly literature it, and in the, the, the archival documents, it's never presented as if they have a choice. It's always presented as they come, they're starving, they need help, they, you know, and then some, 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 uh, some Chetnik organization takes them under its wing and provides them with, uh, with you know, housing and clothing and a sense of belonging. So there's always a sense in which um, they're desperate and they just turn to whoever offers them um, a helping hand. I don't know if that's true. I suspect it's more complicated than that. I mean, in, in conversations with migrants, one certainly gets the, the, the impression that some of them had the opportunity to join the Yugoslav club and they were not interested, right? They, they, they saw their community as being elsewhere with the local church, for example, which was a Catholic church that the Croats went to. So I do, I do think that um, it is experienced as a liberation, and that's certainly reflected in the survey responses, where people, where, where you get a sense where people are making, you know, people, people are saying, well, you want us to come back to Yugoslavia, but the, you know, if I come back, I don't have an apartment anymore. My job won't pay as well. Customs will take most of my, my belongings. I can't afford to import them. Um, you know, why would I come back? I have all these other things here that, that, I've, that I'm choosing. Life is hard here, but I get to choose um, how to live my life. So I think that agency is there. Thank you, Bridget. I think Stephen Siegel had a question. Is that correct, Stephen? Or no. <laughs> Kirill's told me you had a question. Yes, I have yeah, a question. I also <laughs> have one, but you know, Stephen should go first. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay. I mean, I'm I'm just the honorary Yugoslav in the room. Um, <laughs> That's okay. I, I really wanted to know if you could say a few words about um, the gender statistics. I know this is sort of quantity and quality, but uh, you mentioned in, in your book that one third of the migrants were women before 1971. So how, how does this change in some of the cultural representation of these scripts or texts or plots, mm -hmm. especially in the films that, that, you, um, that you analyze and mention through the, the 70s? Is there a moment when the, the centering of, of male emotions gives way to something else? Do you see that happening? And, and this is really the gender question that I wanted to ask. Thanks. Um, so I'm so glad you asked about gender because this grant I'm proposing isn't just comparative, but it's about women. <laughs> because one of the things that's remarkable is um, their, their quasi erasure from the, the historical record. And it's incredibly um, unsettling and bizarre um, until you start picking away at a few things, um, namely the ways in which migration was being framed both in sending states and receiving states in which women were somehow always dependents. Um, and um, yeah, there's, they're, 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 and, and so they don't become part of the archival record. Uh, when their surveys are sent out, it's the head of the household that answers the survey. And so it's never a woman talking about their experiences. Um, discourse is always about guest workers, guest worker programs were shaped around the single male worker. And so women are just erased from this history. Um, and that includes in, in filmic de depictions as well. The only, the only sort of, so I can just off the top of my head, Aller Retour features a woman who goes, who is, is very much depicted, even though she works in the film as well, but she's very much depicted as a dependent on her husband, who's the hero of the story, right? And she ends up going crazy or dies. I'm not sure. I mean, it's, <laughs> there's, there's, there isn't a sense in which um, this is a, a happy ending. There's um, in the film, 
Nenagini Sevan Kros Prozora, the Don't Lean Out the Window, um, there is a, a woman who is a successful labor migrant. She works in a record store and the hero of the story kind of starts a relationship with her, uh, but things go awry for him and he realizes that, um, that he, he was attracted to Germany by lies and that there's nothing for him there. And ultimately he, she, she says, stay here with me. You can, I'll work in the record store. You can live in my apartment, you know? And he says, I can't do that. Don't you realize we're alienated? And I think he's, he, he doesn't just mean we're alienated from Yugoslavia, but our gender roles are alienated. I cannot be a dependent man on you. You know, this is contrary <laughs> to our, you know, our moral, compass. Um, so, so there again, even though you have a successful labor migrant woman, um, it's, a, it's a story of, of failure ultimately. And I, I can't think of too many other depictions of labor migrant women. And so I don't know, and I only go up until the 1980s. So I wonder if things shift with uh, Yugoslavia's breakdown, but I don't really have an answer for that. Thank you, Bridget. Um, um, I'm so glad actually the discussion is so lively. Uh, that's a testament to a great uh, presentation and great books. So I'm going to ask Vladimir Kulich uh, to pose his question. Hello, Brigitte. Uh, thank you very much for the great presentation. I really look forward to, to reading the book finally. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm wondering if you encountered any uh, records of... Uh, the stratification among uh, immigrants, uh, not just in terms of gender and ethnicity and religion, but also in terms of class, because uh, there was a much smaller but still substantial class of, of intellectuals and professionals mm -hmm. who went mm -hmm. abroad. And I'm wondering whether there were any interactions between different mm -hmm. groups uh, in that respect, whether they ever attended uh, the workers' clubs or, or any other kinds of gathering mm -hmm. places, uh, et, 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 et cetera. No, that's a, that is a super interesting question, um, which my sources did not allow me to get at in a systematic way. But again, I, I have some sort of, um, I have a sense of some of these things. So um, I have a sense, for example, that these professional migrants who went abroad, both because they were sort of, uh, they, had, they were better equipped and had more social capital they were able to, um, and, and they sought to orient themselves more towards uh, integrating in the host society than these, um, these other migrants. And so they tended, you know, the, 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 the workers clubs tended to be much more working class. And that's sort of reflected in some of the imagery that we get from, you know, you can sort of tell from the way people dress. Um, that this was more of a working class kind of a place for socializing. Um, so, you know, one, one does get the sense that really they, once they're abroad, um, you know, they are, they're on their own, they're on different trajectories with one another, um, which is interesting because, again, it sort of raises questions about Yugoslavia as a class society, as a classless society, because clearly they, they sort of um, already had class differentiation inside Yugoslavia, and it just becomes more accentuated when they leave. They also, I mean, again, anecdotally, but I get the sense from the surveys when I could tell that someone was educated and that, uh, which you could tell because they were supposed to self-identify, they were supposed to say how much education they had, but the ones who chose to answer the survey, so it's already, there's an act of self-selection there, um, they tended to be much more, critical of Yugoslavia, much more sort of, um, much more oriented towards the receiving state. So yeah, I would say definitely uh, that there's something there, um, it's something that needs to be further fleshed out with more research. Thank you very much, Bridget. Um, well, I have the pleasure actually, and the honor to have the last question before we close the circle today. And I would like to, ask you, I know this is not the focus of the work, but something which um, while I was listening to you and occurred to me as a kind of furthering Emily Grebel's question, 
uh, as I'm very interested in, in general in um, all things security and intelligence related, uh, to me, uh, it makes sense that um, for the description that you have provided for this um, changing dynamics between the political immigration, the older one, and the newer one, the labor migration, my question is, have you, do you have a knowledge or have you um, came across any evidence or records whether uh, the Yugoslav Udba was interested in, in, in this population in, in Germany. I'll be very surprised if they were not a prime subject of uh, scrutiny by the Yugoslav state for multiple reasons. And I would add actually that um, incidentally, I know from other uh, records that uh, some of that population was scrutinized by other intelligence uh, services in neighboring countries and so on. So it, it makes a lot of sense as to why the eyes on this particular population might be there. Yeah, I mean, I would say yes. Um, I would say their encounters with um, the security apparatus happened um, a lot in their uh, interactions with consulates and also um, when crossing the border um, with uh, border officials. Uh, some of them, in fact, complain in the survey of like ill treatment, you know, that they were held at the police station, questioned for hours the last time they went home. Um, so we, there, there is definitely surveillance and scrutiny um, going on. Drago Trumbetas um, shipped some uh, questionable literature. I don't know what it was exactly. Ended up doing some prison time because of that. Um, so, so definitely they're, they're subjected to surveillance. And you know, that is actually why Yugoslavia launches all these other programs um, to, you know, you, you'd ask yourself, well, why, why exactly is the radio program um, giving advice relating to visas, that doesn't make any sense. Well, it's because people were much more likely to contact the radio station with their visa problems than they were to contact the consulate for a variety of different reasons. People are very suspicious of dealing with, with um, these official Yugoslav representative offices. The other thing worth noting is, um, I don't know if this was strictly meant in a surveillance vein, but Yugoslavia briefly tried to activate um, its communists living abroad into sort of sleeper cells that would, you know, sort of have these um, these these, these communists, the, these League of Communists, uh, yeah, these members basically meet abroad on a regular basis. Um, I think it was primarily intended as um, as a way of sort of mobilizing. Um, mobilizing Yugoslav sentiment and uh, cooperation um, abroad, but it could also have been used for surveillance, certainly. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Brigitte. All right, well, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming. And next week, we're gonna have Alexander Maxwell talking about North Macedonia. Um, in the meantime, I wanted to share with you a link to a podcast that my, that my students and I worked on and completed this fall on North Macedonian EU accession that talks a lot about the sticky kind of nature of history and memory and the politics of history in today's policy world. So I welcome you to listen to that. So um, I hope to see you guys all next week and we'll have, I'm sure, other people joining us. Um, so thank you for coming and thank you so much for Brigitte. This was fascinating and I hope everyone goes and buys your book if you don't have it already. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for having me. This was a real pleasure and I loved your questions and I look forward to seeing everyone in the flesh sometime soon. <laughs>